thank you all for coming. It's great to have you all here for our now third Big 100 event. Um, I would like to uh, now introduce our next two guests, Mike Minogue of Abiumed and Stu Randall of GI Dynamics. Would you please join me in giving them a really warm welcome? Okay. Yeah, we're very DIY at Mass Device. Well, thanks so much to both of you for joining us. Um, Mike, I would like to begin with you and a pretty interesting project that you are involved with. I know it's pretty well known that you're a Gulf War veteran, maybe less well known that you're really involved in, in veterans' causes. I know AdvoMed's launching a big program aimed at veterans, and I was hoping you could fill us in a little bit about that, tell us how it came about and, and what you're hoping to achieve. Sure, so first, it's uh, great to be here today, and it's tough to follow Mike, and I know he's gonna be incredibly successful at Boston Sci, and he's been successful in every job he's done. Uh, what we in the industry have started is a program to help bring in military veterans. And it was uh, started through conversations with wounded warriors, who when they would go out and they would try to get into the industry, or even veterans that are college educated want to get into med tech, they really didn't have a, a platform or way to get in. And so I'm very proud that if you look at all the major companies in the Massachusetts area, they've already signed up to be part of the program to help fund it, Boston Sci, Covidian, uh, Hemanetics, there's a, there's a good group. And what it is is it takes the wounded warriors that are going back to school that want internships, we're gonna bring them into the, the companies to teach them. And sometimes they've even had interviews where they're competing with college kids and they've been given the response, well, you're not qualified, you haven't done as much as the other people over the last two years, and you know, some of them have been in a hospital for 18 months recouping. So, uh, but they're very passionate about healthcare because they have spent so much time in hospitals and some have double amputees or post-traumatic stress. So the industry is gonna bring them in. We're gonna identify the thousands of veterans that are in the med tech space as mentors. We're also gonna help do a boot camp event so that we bring them in and, and help them understand the process and what the industry is about. And then we're gonna try and expand it and make it kind of the, uh, the, the industry program worldwide. Uh, press release is gonna go out tomorrow uh, by Avamed, listing all the companies and the new companies. The FDA is gonna have a statement endorsing it because long term what we wanna see also is the more leadership we have in the industry the more benefit we can create new products and innovation around helping these people who have sacrificed so much. And so I'm excited, and uh, I think Avamed, it'll be open to MDMA, our company's a member of both, and then for all the other companies that want to participate. So uh, thanks for asking. Yeah, you're welcome. One, so a little while ago you told us something that I, th I thought was pretty interesting, is that there's almost a natural affinity between the military and the medical device field. And I was hoping you could sort of expand a little bit on that. Sure, I think uh, a lot of it has to do with what Mike said, is that uh, if you're in the military, you are dedicated to serving a mission. And uh, you serve something that's greater than an individual endpoint. And when you're in the military, you really have a sense of dedication. In some cases, you're deployed for long periods of time. You're under stress. And uh, a lot of the folks, when they come out, they want to continue to serve. And I could never be a CEO of a toaster oven company. I wouldn't work that hard. Uh, I wouldn't be that dedicated. I have, a, I have five kids, and uh, I'm, I love being with my wife and kids. And, but I understand their sacrifices because I lead a company that innovates. And we do save lives. It sounds hokey and naive and, and uh, all the things that sometimes people forget about. But if you're in this industry, it's tough. Uh, there's regulatory, there's risk, but you do it because you love the impact of helping patients. And I think that's, that's a very common thing you see in the military. So turning to you, Stu, I have to tell you, we spoke, I think it was in December 2010. Uh, we were pretty early on in our road. And something you said then has really stuck with me, and it's become something of a touchstone for me when you know, going through the vagaries of day-to-day -day business life. You said you just accept that there are very, very good days, some pretty bad days, and you just try to push through it and, and put your best foot forward. And I'm guessing that that philosophy has served you pretty well over the last 20 months or so with a global economic crisis, yeah. taking the company public, amassing all the good clinical data that you guys have, have put up. So I was hoping you could sort of 
you know, take us through what it was like with the market swinging 500 points day to day, and you're you're out there trying to <clears throat> sell an IPO. Yeah, it was quite a quite a uh, a three month period for us last year. So we on the high low piece, we we went public as some people know in Australia on September 7th of last year. But we did two around the world road shows, uh, one in May and one in July. And although we went public in Australia, we also raised capital in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and London. So when we did our final road show, we did a preliminary one in May, <clears throat> had extraordinary enthusiasm. We did our final non-US road show, uh, started just about this time last year. Um, we left Australia uh, July 28th or so, after spending a week in London, a week in Hong Kong, Singapore, a week in Australia. And um, I think it's fair to say we had significantly more demand than we had anticipated. So we, we are having discussions about raising the price and raising the amount of the raise. Um, and in the background, there was this little trepidation that um, if you weren't intimately involved last year, you may forget that August 2nd was the date the US was going to default on its debt last year. And so there's a little bit of concern about that. <clears throat> so, but we left Australia nonetheless you know, with exceeding confidence that this was going to be a slam dunk and, you know, we were going to raise a ton of capital at a great valuation and life would be wonderful. Um, so we came back and then we had a, uh, a kind of 10-day road show here in the U.S. Uh, to track some U.S. money. <clears throat> the U.S. did not default on its debt on August 2nd, which was my wife's birthday as well, so that was quite a conundrum for me. Um, but as you, some of you may remember, S&P decided to downgrade the U.S. debt three days later. So in our, our offering, Australia's got kind of a bizarre process for a public offering. And so we, we have this open period where retail investors can participate and other things can happen uh, through the end of August. So uh, when the S&P downgraded the debt somewhere around the 5th, 6th, 7th of August, we were actually in the middle of a U.S. roadshow. And market, markets were going up and down, mostly down 5% a day. Um, and we had uh, retail... We had some banks in Australia and also in Asia who had committed significant, verbally committed, and some actually written commitments on significant capital uh, from high net worth family offices and Asian gazillionaires. And as the market volatility started swinging five plus percent a day here, greater than that in the other markets, um, that demand started diminishing. And uh, it made for a couple, a few very, very intense, stressful, uh, challenging weeks, but um, you know, we, Mike talked about innovation, and Mike here talked about uh, you know perseverance and whatnot. So we, you know, <clears throat> when you've got a disruptive technology with enormous markets that do phenomenal things for patients, um, there are investors out there that take a very long-term view, and we ended up closing, you know, 80 plus million dollars September 7th last year, uh, almost exclusively from from long-term investors. Um, who take a real long-term view about the opportunities that, that do, do exist in, in the healthcare space. So, so we closed it, and uh, that was a very good day. So London, Australia, and what was the third place? Hong Kong and Singapore. Hong Kong. A lot of frequent flyer miles, huh? I got a few. Yeah. You got that black card like in the Georgia. Uh, yeah, so the good news is if you go around the world, you can get a around-the-world ticket from these airlines. And you get a around-the-world yeah. ticket, there's a couple of restrictions, but they're actually reasonably good fares. Yeah. Well. And I did once each direction in May Brian, and July. Brian, you taking notes? <laughs> so what drove the decision to float the IPO in the Australian market? Um, so that's, I'll give you the short version. So the short version is we were looking to raise capital in 2010. And on our board uh, was Steve Osterley from Medtronic, who's an investor. J&J uh, &J was also, an, is still a large investor. And uh, uh, Brian Halleck from Domain. And when we were talking about doing a, a private raise uh, with maybe some potential new strategics, they said, look, we're working with the company Riva. It's got a bioabsorbable stent. They um, uh, are looking to go public on the Australian exchange, and it looks like they might actually make it. And we're like, I said something along the lines of, if I don't want to run a US public company, why in the world would I ever want to run an Australian public company? Um, but in any case, we, we kept that option open. Um, December 23rd of 2010, Riva went public on the Australian exchange. They had treated a relatively small number of patients with less than spectacular results and raised a ton of money at an extraordinary valuation. So we uh, said it's something that we should certainly investigate as we parallel path a couple things. So at JP Morgan that year, uh, Steve Osterley from Medtronic introduced us to the bankers in Australia that took them public. They had also taken Hardware public, a local company, uh, Doug Gottschall's CEO, 
great company. <clears throat> um, they had raised uh, actually three rounds in Australia, um, public markets before they came to the US. So I was JP Morgan in 2011. We met with the bankers uh, from Australia that took them out and started a parallel path process with them as well as our other financing. And you know, that, the short answer is it ultimately really looked like it was the highest probability of success, least risky option from, from the other things that we evaluated. Are investors down under just that much less risk averse? <clears throat> well, the fallacy is all the money came from Australia. And in reality, a third came from Australia, a third from London, a sixth from Hong Kong and Singapore, and a sixth from Australia. And uh, the difference is that, I think the difference is really twofold. One, the investors that we attracted are really long-term holding investors. We have no hedge funds. Uh, they can't short in Australia, which I know Mike is really jealous of. Um, and uh, they're mostly generalist. So they're not, you know, it's not like uh, Mike Mahoney was in New York today having fun with the investment analyst in the States. You know, these, these are pretty much generalist investors. So again, big market, um, great technology, great results, good management team. I'm going to hold this thing for a number of years. Why am I not? Why should I not put a ton of money in? So, diff very different investor base than you would see here. Mike, uh, turning to you, uh, I'm told that you wrote Jack Welch a, a, an unsolicited letter <laughs> back in your salad days, attached a resume when you were looking to, to land at GE. How'd that work out for you? Uh, it worked out well. <laughs> um, so I, uh, as I talked about getting into the industry, I wanted to get into the industry. So I. Uh, rather than go through the normal process, I wrote directly to him. I attached my resume. Uh, he wrote something very nice on my resume, and then when I started interviewing, people thought I was a family member or had a connection. <laughs> so it seemed to work for me, and it got, got me in the door. Oh, yeah. so. Well, let me be certainly probably not the first person to congratulate you on, on putting some black ink in the ledgers over there at Abbey Med. It only took 31 years. All kidding aside. Uh, you know, you've only been there, your, I think you're in your ninth year now, yeah. and have pretty much completely revived its fortunes. Um, I'm really interested in, you know, walking us back to, to those days. How'd you hatch that turnaround strategy? How'd you know that was going to be the, the pony you were going to ride? So in kindergarten, you have to have show and tell. So this is my uh, shameless prompt to have you invest in our company. But this is the world's smallest hard pump. And if you think about the mission of the company was uh, to replace the heart, the world, to build the world's only artificial heart. It was started in 1964, along the same times they were talking about sending a man to the moon. And the company did build an artificial heart. It's completely implantable. I'm very proud of what it did. It's the most complex medical device ever made. There's a lot of things we learned that have been incorporated into helping hearts recover under surgical products. And there's thousands of people that are walking around today with their own hearts because of our surgical business that recovered. But the artificial heart uh, was very expensive to make. Um, and it's bigger than my fist. It's probably too big for my heart. And today we make this pump, which is just above my fingers. The motor is the gray part. And so this can be put in through a small hole in the leg in minutes. It's 1 100th the size of the heart. And it can do half to all of the work. And so our focus today is about recovering hearts. And so the way we turned it around is you start with strategy and you say, what do I have to build by or buy? Or what do I have to switch to? So I knew within my first year and a half that our strength was in recovery. Our strength for recovery is the best quality of life and it's also cost effective. And then what we started looking at is options to get us to the cath lab but still promote recovery. And that's how we ended up with acquiring this platform that now we have several products. Uh, and we also did is, you know, the other decisions you make is do I expand my focus? Do I narrow the focus or I completely switch it? And what we did is we took our recovery focus and we really narrowed it to the cath lab. We declared ourselves an interventional cardiology company, moved everything into that space, and then we just did the old fashioned adapt and execute to to get to success. All right, so that was my next question is, you know, now you have this, this plan, seems like it's a good one. How do you go about executing to that and making sure that it is in fact successful? So the, the product is now in 600 plus hospitals. Um, if we can obsolete the old technology that we're trying to replace for patients that are already in the hospital, already suffering from hemodynamic instability, 
If we just get half of those U.S. patients, that's a billion dollars in revenue. And that doesn't include outside the U.S., doesn't include Japan, and doesn't include any of our other products. And so that's, that's our laser focus. Uh, we also have some newer products that are coming uh, for the right side. We have a new implantable device coming, and we will be entering into the Japan market, which should be uh, probably one of our biggest markets in the world because they have a smoking population, they don't have transplants, and they have higher mortality from, uh, from heart attack. So it's a, really going to be a great opportunity for us. Stu, can we talk a little bit about the endo barrier? Can sure. you just sort of give us the two-minute elevator pitch on what it is, what it does? Uh, yeah, so um, Mike's got a complex little device there. I'm, I'm proud to say the first time we were at FDA, they called it elegant in its simplicity. Uh, many of the people in the room know Andy Levine, who came up with the concept. So uh, the, the, the concept came about from bariatric surgery, and, the, and there's literature back to the 80s. When you do a gastric bypass procedure, on a patient who's obese as well as diabetic, their diabetes goes away almost immediately. And when you do that, anything with the stomach, any manipulation, shrinkage, suture, uh, any of those other things, that, that effect is not, does not happen. So Andy came up with the concept, let's, uh, as we would say, mechanically as opposed to surgically bypass the intestine. So we put an impermeable membrane in the intestine. Uh, we deliver it and remove it endoscopically, prevent food from contacting the wall of the intestine and in essence deliver the same, same immediate effects on diabetes and on weight that you do from gastric bypass. But there's no surgery, <clears throat> um, there's no permanent, no permanent effects from you know, manipulating the anatomy and all those things. So patients love it, endoscopists love it, uh, endocrinologists love it, uh, surgeons debate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, one thing I find really interesting about it is that there's sort of evidence that its effects persist even if yeah. after it's been removed. And I was hoping you could sort of unpack that a little bit for us. <sighs> how does that mechanism work? Yeah, well, the short answer is nobody knows exactly how it works. Um, but what we have proven, what we have shown in clinical trials that no other device company has, has shown, is when, we, when you put our device in, uh, there's an immediate increase in a hormone called GLP-1, which is uh, Amelin's drug Bieta and Novo's drug Victoza. So it's clearly known for anti-diabetic effects. There's an immediate increase in a hormone called PYY, which makes you more uh, greater sense of satiety, so you're less hungry. We've also shown an immediate sustained increase in insulin sensitivity. Um, so what we know is that there's dramatic hormonal effects delivered by preventing food from contacting the wall of the intestine. So there's a number of theories about establishing a new metabolic set point. Um, these hormonal effects do some magic in the in the pancreas, which no one totally understands, but. Um, there's theories about resting, rejuvenating, regenerating beta cells. Beta cells are what produce insulin. Um, and this, this energy expenditure and new metabolic set point that really, uh, in essence, puts these patients in a completely different state. Because remember, they've had their diabetes under control for a year. They've lost generally 20% of their, of their body weight. Um, and so they are a completely different person with a completely different kind of metabolic state. And so we believe the hormonal effects generate those results those results then help maintain that, that kind of new state for a prolonged period of time. So you're almost setting up a, a new sort of positive yeah. feedback yep. loop. Right? Absolutely. So tell us where you are without saying anything that might trigger a regulatory filing. Uh, sort of on the path to U.S. approval, I know you're on the market in uh, Austria, Australia, Chile, yep. the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, so with the U.S., uh, we, we actually got approval from the FDA to do a study a couple of years ago, and it's, in our, and it's publicly disclosed. And the objective was um, we expected challenges when we went to the FDA to say, look, we're going to put a liner in the intestine and we want to go after a diabetes indication. And it was unclear how they might respond to that. And they actually responded quite well um, and got an approval to do a study. We wanted to wait for kind of the next generation device, which we now have CE marked approved. Um, so we are actively engaged with the FDA today. We're having some very productive meetings and conversations and uh, communication. Um, I will put a plug in for Avamed. I think uh, I'm on the board of Avamed, as are the two mics that are here tonight. Um, I think the, the, the uh, um, advocacy and the pressure that has been put both by Avamed and the legislatures on FDA, at least by the, with the group we're working with, has clearly been felt. And the conversations have taken a fairly nice, decisive turn in general, the, the tone of those conversations in the last 12 to 18 months. So I'm Cautiously optimistic that you will be hearing more from us on our FDA plans uh, later this year. Very good, very good. So each of you has taken what was then a pretty unproven innovative medical technology, shepherded it through 
all the development process to commercialization. With the benefit of that hindsight, if you were facing a new CEO of a young company that's got some, some hot technology they're, they're eager to get on the market, what would you tell her or him is sort of, as sort of a guiding principle for them to, to, to weather this uncertain environment that we're all in? Sue? There we go. So I think, first of all, I think as all three of us have talked about, you've you got to absolutely believe in what you're doing. And a lot of people use the word passion. I think it's overused. But you've got to believe in what you're doing. And what you're doing, what the company plans to do, really can make a huge difference in the world. Um, so I think that's number one. I think number two, you have to have, you know, particularly in the startup world, you've got to have extraordinary perseverance. Uh, and then thirdly, you've got to have a hell of a lot of stamina. Um, you know, you've got good days and bad days and a lot of very, very long days. And uh, uh, I happen to believe that in the big company world, we all learn stamina um, over the years. And I think it's really an attribute that's necessary. Mike, what's your take? So I'd agree with everything uh, Stu said. I would add to that is uh, raise more money than you need. Sooner than you need. Sooner than you need. Uh, you're going to need mental toughness for a lot of the things, and that's part of leadership, is, is inspiring the people and having the mental toughness to get through the, the hurdles. Uh, move faster on processes and people than you think you need to. Don't overspend or overinvest in either IT or clinical studies. And uh, the one lesson I'm trying to learn now is enjoy the journey a little more. All right, very good, very good. Are we, uh, do we have time for a quick Q&A? Few questions. Mike Mahoney, would you come up and, and expose yourself to our wonderful audience? <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> it's a tough crowd. Expose the wisdom that you've accrued through the many years. Do we have any, any questions? It's gonna be quick. Question. so much is is culture driven and the sizes of your companies are so different but companies are really about the people whether it's a scientist or the sales force and I don't think anything's really more important about setting culture and Mike you talked about it but if you all talk about how you get everyone to feel that passion and to work those long hours and to think through patients eyes and to persevere when the FDA is maybe not seeing the things you are if you could talk about that that would be great Shall I go first? So. Where I came from a bigger company. I was also in, uh, in environments where there is a lot of brainwashing at West Point in the Army, and GE, of course. And uh, <laughs> believe in that culture or the cult of it is very positive. So what we tried to define is what are the four principles of our culture. So one is the most important is recovering hearts and saving lives, because that motivates everyone. And that's the, that will get you through any type of obstacle if you just focus on that. Two is we want to pride as a small company that we can out innovate, move quicker, and have better scientists than the big companies. We're not intimidated, it's the David and Goliath, and, and we feel very comfortable, and we want to keep that pride in the company. Third is we want people to trust us, invest in us, so we want to have, we want to grow shareholder value. That's important for our employees, that's important for the investors. And last is the, you know, the secret sauce is you have to sustain a winning culture, which means you get results with integrity. <clears throat> yeah, and I just I would add just a couple things. One, I think it's important again since we're all in healthcare to to uh, make sure everyone in the company knows the effect that you are having on patients. So we try to get patient uh, testimonials, input, feedback, whatnot, so that so that all of you know the people on the back making the product understand you know what it really is doing and how it's changing people's lives. Um, I think that's one one critical piece. I think the other is just the classic taking care of the people. Um, you know, and I think we've been eight years, nine years now, I think we've had three people leave voluntarily, and I think, you know, I, one of the things we do is really try to do what we can to take care of the people, comp, benefits, however you want to define the culture, uh, you know, rewards, recognition, uh, making everybody feel that what they do really does make a difference. Um, so those are two things I would add to Mike's comments. Can you hear me okay? Am I on? All right. You know, not a whole lot to add on top of that. I think yeah, people work in medical device because they, they want to help patients. And, and you talked about having good days and bad days. And I think uh, when you always bring it back to that, that's, a, that's the starting point. And uh, then it's the competitiveness. And then I think driving accountability, 
fostering innovation. So when you internally or whether you acquire companies, uh, you want to ensure that the companies still believe if they've been acquired by a Boston Scientific that they can innovate. And you want to have that internally with your organic uh, scientists as well. So that culture of innovation is a really big deal. And I'll just add the last one to us beyond rewards and recognition is that this global mindset. Yeah. So if, if you can have your leaders thinking about how their products that they're innovating could help in Asia or in, in Turkey or in Russia and create those, that network and this connect, that connectivity around the world, you get a faster company that's more capable uh, and can compete faster with a small company. So we want, Mike wants to not be intimidated by a big company, we want to move faster than the smaller companies. And that's the goal that uh, we have at Boston Scientific. Do we have another question? Uh, John Eckberg with Cook uh, Group. Uh, I want to ask about the medical device tax. <laughs> Why is that? Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, it strikes me that we're, it's 2004 and we're um, on Patong Bay and talking about the color of the beach chairs. Uh, what's going to be the impact of this tax on your companies? And long term, uh, do you see that it will lead to more mergers, acquisitions, and uh, lower R&D costs? We have no U.S. revenue, so it's not going to affect us, so we're fine. Although we're working very hard with Avamed to, uh, to change the... And one of the things we are working with at Avamed is to, is to work clearly very hard with the legislators to, to modify it, first to try to repeal it, and then secondly to modify it um, so that it doesn't have... so that it has a much smaller impact on, on companies with less than revenue approximating the $100 million. So, I mean, our... Our, my perspective is that the device tax has nothing to do with health care reform. It's right. a tax policy issue and it ought to be treated separately. Uh, there is support on both sides from Democrats and uh, Republicans, even in our own state here in Massachusetts, to repeal it. Uh, it is unprecedented to tax non-profitable companies. So we've, we've just become profitable but there are a lot of companies that are either not profitable or trying to become profitable that this is going to wipe out their profits, which again will impact their share price, EPS, and everything else. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I am optimistic, and I think Avamed's doing a nice job of maintaining support from both parties that I think a tax uh, reform policy will hopefully eliminate it because it really will damage what is a gem of an industry for the U.S. Yeah. Yep. I don't think I got anything to add. No, it just it doesn't. Uh, N nothing more there. It's a big impact. Uh, we publicly stated it's over 100 million, about 125 million dollar impact on Boston Scientific, if that tax goes through. And so we've been very active with Advamed, uh, and we're still hopeful that it will either be rescinded or refined in some way, because uh, it's it's uh, we do believe it impacts jobs. Uh, we don't believe it's healthy for what's what's a fantastic industry that, uh, you know. So we're hopeful that we can refine this policy in some way, because if not, $125 million is a lot of money, and it's, uh, companies have to be smart and make up for that. And to pass that on to hospitals and price increases is not practical in this environment, so you have to make it up through productivity. So we, th we agree with Mike and the rest of the group here at Avamed that doesn't make sense, and we're still optimistic that it will be refined. Well, I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us tonight. It's been a real pleasure having you, and we're grateful to you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.